Uh, so, um, yes, the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, uh, Joaquin Dopazo. He's the director of the bioinformatics area of the uh, Progressive Salud Fund Foundation. He has previously directed the computational genomics department of uh, Fe Principe Felipe Research Center in Valencia, the bioinformatics unit uh, of the CNIO in Madrid, and the bioinformatics group of uh, Glaxo Welcome uh, SA in this campus. His other work uh, covers functional genomics and systems biology oriented towards personalized medicine, and is currently working on laying the foundations to facilitate the use of genomic data for patients within the health system in Andalusia. So thank you so much, uh, Joaquin, for being here. You can share your screen. And uh, Okay, so thank you. Start. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pity that I cannot be there to, to share this, this excellent meeting with you in this uh, nice place. So um, let me see. Mm. I think you can see my screen. Yes. OK, good. So um, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, um, uh, well, maybe the title is a, is a bit clickbait, but, but, but the idea is that we can manage to uh, use the uh, the big amount of data that we have uh, available now to try to learn some uh, biology, some biology in terms of uh, uh, connection, functional connection between genes from the, the data. But uh, once we know very well the context in this connection, in, in which this connection happened. So if you have a look at the application of uh, artificial intelligence in health, you can see that the most successful application are related with image, are related with signal analysis, are related with text, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all these data have several properties. One of them is that these are typically data which are uh, that can be easily uh, encoded for for the for the algorithm. And on the other hand, they have quite simple relationship between the features. So in, in an image, the, the relationships are geometrical relationships. So a pixel is related with the next pixel more related than the pixel in the, on the other corner of the, of the, of the, piece, of the um, uh, image. And you typically have a lot of data for training. And contrarily, in the case of genomic data, we have a very complex encoding because different questions typically can have different encoding of the data. Uh, the features, if the features of the genes, uh, they have complex relationship uh, among them. And uh, even thought that we have a lot of data on, on Earth, a lot of genomic data on Earth, uh, it is very difficult to find um, data sets large enough to, to train, to properly train the data. So the relationship between data and the number of features that we need to train uh, is not, it's not as uh, satisfactory as in the case of images, for example, etc. So I mentioned that different questions uh, uh, require different encodings. Uh, what is the, the main question? The main question uh, typically is definition of phenotype. Um, typically, we, may, we, we are thinking of a phenotype related to disease, uh, either the disease or the response for, of, for a drug or for a treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in, in medicine, in personalized medicine, we use this uh, biomarker, which are typically mutations on genes, and these biomarkers are used to uh, provide specific treatment for specific patients. This is what we call personalized medicine. And actually, they have been very successful. Uh, you can see here is a, is a not very uh, uh, study from the 90s, uh, from 90s to the 20s, and the progression uh, in survival in cancer. So we have passed from a 50% of survival in cancer overall, to uh, almost a 70%, which is uh, fantastic. And um, one major factor in this successful, in this success of the treatment has been the use of this biomarker. However, these biomarkers, um, these conventional biomarkers, they are uh, 
successful, but this success has to do with the probabilistic association with the twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, uh, this uh, uh, association is sometimes is uh, modest and in many cases uh, lack the mechanistic uh, relationship with the fundamental cell processes. And we actually know that most uh, trites are the result of the interaction, the interplay between a lot of genes. So uh, typically causative genes are in, in a, what we call a biological module, right? So uh, actually when we use these biomarkers, we are using the tip of the iceberg of the real process. Um, and actually there are some, um, some multigenic biomarkers that actually take maybe, if not all the module, part of the module and actually predict much better phenotype. This is the mama print, which is a, a very famous example of, of a breast cancer decision support test, which is based on the, on the activity of 70 genes. And actually this paper is very nice because they actually uh, simulate the behavior of one of these modules and, and demonstrated that the, the, the value that they obtain for the activity of the, the module is, is more related to the trite, which is in this case is a, um, a patient survival, than the activity of any individual gene. Uh, uh, you have to keep in mind that this, this activity is inferred, it's not measured. You measure the activity of the genes and you infer the activity. So we have this a lot of information on how the genes relate to each other, which are these uh, uh, pathways. And the pathways is a um, uh, recopilation of the, of the knowledge, of the biological knowledge on how genes interact, functionally interact to each other. Mm -hmm. And how there are cascades of genes which activate to each other and one gene at the end of this cascade triggers a uh, given function. And there are different repositories, typically extracting this information for different sources. And there is a, one of them is Wiki Pathways. Uh -oh. people, uh, contribute, people contribute with information. And there are other specific pathways in which you have this information, but um, especially uh, in the context of, of diseases. So um, we have to do to understand how genes relate to each other is to try to understand how the function is triggered by these genes, right? So if we have a look at this simplified um, um, version of the apoptosis pathway, we can see that this, um, when we, we have a look at this, at this uh, different sub pathways or pathways, what we have is the conceptualization of some a group of functions you know, related, for example, in the case of, uh, case of uh, apoptosis with cell death. But typically in this pathway, you have both uh, functions. You have cell death, but you have cell survival because typically you have all the process that goes in both directions. So to understand how a pathway works, uh, you cannot look at the pathway as a whole because saying that you have a lot of activity of the genes in the pathway means nothing because you don't know if the cell is committing suicide or if the cell is surviving. And uh, pointing to a specific gene is also an informative because for example, you, you, you look at the gene BAD, which is here in the, involved in two of these sub pathways, you can see that it depends very much on the rest of, of the partners gene, it can lead to survival or it can lead to cell death if the gene is active. But if the gene is, in, is not active, uh, there are other ways by which the pathway can go to survival or to cell death. So uh, pointing one single gene is uh, again an informative. So what we do is to try to focus in um, all the genes we trigger the specific functions and then go backwards until the 
Uh, so essentially going from the right part of the figure to the left part, circuit by circuit, and we model what happened in the circuits. Hmm? This is an example of, there are different ways of modeling this activity. This is one of the most successful, which is something like, very similar to a propagation of probability in which the values of gene activity are taken as, as, uh, as are used to calculate the, the, the joint probability of the activity of the, of the circuit. And so we can calculate what is the activity of the, the circuit and therefore, in theory, we would have the activity of this specific function in the cell. Um, uh, interestingly, these um, models um, convey causality because essentially what you calculate, what you do is to calculate the activity of the function as a consequence of the activities of the different genes. So if a gene changes the, the uh, level of activity, it has a consequence on the, on the activity of the function or not. It depends very much on where is the gene and how is the, uh, are the other behaving the rest of the genes. Um, let me show you some examples in which we apply this, this type of um, um, models to, to real data taken from the uh, cancer um, atlas uh, in which they have a real patient. They have measured the gene expression in the biopsies and they know what happened with the patient at the end. Uh, and they have some covariables, co et cetera, but not, not a lot, but enough to, to, to do the analysis. And you, you can um, identify in the cell functions, functionalities which has to do with cancer, like uh, apoptosis, like angiogenesis, like repli DNA replication, which means proliferation, or cell addition, which is related to the potential arising of metastasis. You can see that in patients with a high activity of anti-apoptosis, they have a clearly worse prognosis. Patient with a high activity of DNA replication, they die clearly more than the patient with a lower activity. Patient with low cell adhesion die more than the, the rest of patient. And same with patient with a high angiogenesis. So we, we, we can see how the, we can infer a function which has to do with a phenotype and the phenotype has a consequence and this consequence is patient survival and there is a clear correlation. And there is even more interesting because you can use these models for, for um, infer, you can take a, um, um, a condition and you can say, what would happen if I uh, knock out the gene? So you take the condition and you, put this gene to zero, for example, and you, and you do the comparison and you can see what pathways and what sub-pathways and what circuits are affected. And you can calculate the, 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 the function which are affected. And this is an example in which we infer, um, um, we predict what mutations or what uh, inhibition would kill a, a cancer cell line, a group, a experimental group, uh, could confirm our prediction and we publish that in cancer research. So, uh, arriving to this point, something which is very easy is, okay, let's try, let's, let's to uh, include this relationship between the genes that we already know in the architecture of uh, deep neural level, for example, to try to learn or to predict characteristics. And actually they work, uh, quite well. So this uh, deep networks uh, with an architecture inspired in biology. But this is this is only the introduction for, 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 the, for, for the talk, but this is important to put in context. So all these um, models require of these pathways. And currently we have only one third of the genome which are part of these pathways, just because we have not generated so uh, 
much uh, biological knowledge to have all these connections. So uh, producing one of these arrows is a lot of work because you have to demonstrate that you have to detect what protein is interacting with, with your protein, what type of interaction is this, and uh, under what conditions, and you have to prove that this is doing this, uh, this interaction is actually what you expect, etc. etc. So um, the idea would be, um, so this, this is a slow process, an experimental slow process, and it can take years. And actually, we wait for the all the genome you know, to, to be modeled, uh, to be uh, part of this pathway. We have to expect maybe 50 years or 100 years. So we don't have so much time. So one of the ideas was, would it be possible to use some um, machine learning algorithm to generate this biological knowledge from the data? That is, using this data on gene expression, for example, to try to learn these arrows? Well, we are in a problem of, of course of dimensionality clearly because we don't have so much data yet to, 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 to do that from scratch. But it is true that we could try to reduce the dimensionality of the problem and say, okay, let's not to be so ambitious. We are not going to solve all the biology in one shot, but let's try to see if we can manage to relate some proteins which are interesting for some reason to the part of the biological knowledge that we already have. That is to, 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 to draw one or two or a few, a few arrows. Obviously, um, in this example, uh, if this external, I don't know if you can see the, the mouse, but I mean, the gene who has a, a, a blue arrow if we manage to say, okay, this gene is actually uh, affecting this cell function, but probably we, we cannot go to the detail of what gene, uh, through what gene is doing this, this action. But I mean, to me, if we can manage to put the big arrow that uh, from this external gene, you know that is affecting the function, to me, it would be would be great. So, we uh, so in the middle of the pandemic, we got some some money for for this project uh, about drug repurposing, right? In 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 COVID. So, um, fortunately, we were part of this uh, consortium, the COVID nineteen disease map community. It's a large community with more than. 200 biocurators, uh, modelers, domain experts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in uh, more than 100 institutions in 30 countries. And the idea was to, to, to design a very, very detailed uh, map of all uh, what uh, any, any event that happened uh, once the virus infects the body not only the infection, but all the consequences downstream um, regarding um, immunological uh, activation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the consequences. So uh, they delineate this very detailed map, which is the, like a, a very nice pathway. And the idea is, okay, let's use this map, uh, uh, let's model this map, and let's try to see if we can predict the, the activity of this map or parts of this map from the activity of other proteins, being these other proteins target for other known drugs, with the idea of if some of these proteins can predict the behavior of the um, of the map, then uh, probably the drugs against these proteins could act on the map, or in other words, probably there are candidates for drug repulsion, right? So um, we use this training data set, which are approximately 
12,000 uh, uh, gene expression profiles uh, from the GTEx project from different organs. So we have a variety of, of combination of genes relating among them. And we try to see if we can manage to do this prediction using a multi, uh, multi auto random forest regression using a uh, SHAP, uh, SHAP additive explanation to try to see what of these um, um, features in this case were the most influential over the map. So in that case, uh, well, this is a small sample of some of the, of the results uh, in which uh, you could see that a specific, uh, um, a specific uh, protein, which is target of a specific drug, has a lot of effects in uh, this pathway, which is uh, cell receptor signaling pathway, whatever, which is related in that case with the immune activity. So we have the detail of where the proteins which uh, were the more relevant proteins are acting at the level of pathways and what these pathways are related to the, what we call the, the, uh, uh, the COVID holders. So we have different effects, immune activity, antiviral defense, endocytosis, inflammatory response, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do a little detail. So interestingly, in the moment in which we have the paper, uh, in review, uh, uh, they published this other paper, which is a um, review of all the trials. It was a review of the trials currently in this moment. It was one year and a half ago. All the clinical trials, the testing treatments and prevention for COVID-19. And interestingly, uh, almost all the drugs that were um, in testing in this uh, clinical trial which have um, um, a specific uh, target were predicted by our model. I say that have a specific target because other didn't have a clear target, other I like inhalation of gas. So it's, we don't know where exactly is, is acting in, over which protein, but all these drugs which have a specific target or a couple of targets or whatever could be modeled and were modeled by our model, and, and we could see that. So we, we were more or less <laughs> on the way. So then what we did was try to say, OK, let's see if some of these drugs can be detected in the, in the patient. So we have uh, here in Andalusia this population health database, which contains all the clinical data for more than 13 million patients from Andalusia. Uh, with there is a um, one month of delay between uh, the the moment in which these data are recorded in the hospital and and the moment in which they go to the, the database. So we could uh, follow more or less the what was happening during the first uh, wave of the of COVID. And uh, so we were checking some of the um, of the drugs that were. Uh, used in this moment. Uh, actually, the first one was this uh, vitamin D, which for some reason that I never understood, but was very um, uh, popular in our region. So uh, there was a, a high interest in this uh, vitamin D. And we could see that actually we have we have uh, predicted that vitamin D will have a protective effect. And actually, this is what we see. And there is a clear uh, protective effect. So we managed to, to, to collect a retrospective cohort of more than 16,000 patients. And a number, a large number of them, uh, I mean, not very large, but uh, since there were 16,000, there was a, a large enough number of them. Uh, actually, the numbers are there is in the range of uh, 1,000, 500, different, different, um, uh, different uh, drugs. Um, they were taking this drug just because other conditions that they have before, and then in the causal analysis, they, it demonstrated to be uh, protective. Actually, we extend this uh, analysis, and many of the drugs that we predicted um, are 
uh, I mean, many know, but some of the data that we predicted were uh, demonstrated an effect. Uh, so the idea was to use this, uh, well, I mean, to, to use all the covariables that we already know that uh, could affect to the uh, prognosis of the, of the uh, disease and to evolution of the disease and try to see if in the same condition have uh, being a patient which uh, have a prescription of a given drug was better for you or was worse for you. And in some cases it was clearly protective. So just for finishing, um, I always show this, this um, slide to, to, to my students in, in the courses saying, okay, we have made here a whole cycle from the hypothesis uh, to the validation. We model the biological knowledge, we learn with data, from data, and we validate with real world evidence with data. We did all the process without doing any single experiment. We just use data. And, um, but the idea is that, uh, apart from this, is that we managed to find these drugs, this, um, uh, these repurposed drugs is because we know that these, uh, the, their targets have an arrow directed to the mechanistic map of the, of the disease. So we have learned this arrow from the data. We have learned biology at the end of the data. And well, that's all for, for me. And this uh, is part of the group. Uh, when we could, <laughs> in those times in which we, we could take a picture all together. <laughs> and so thank you very much for your attention. And I will be happy to take any question you have. Let me, let me have, okay, here. Okay, are there any questions from the audience? No? Okay, I have a question, uh, two actually. Um, so the first is about the, the first is about like the, your studies using the, the population health database in Andalusia, like uh, uh, how, how your findings can be uh, like translated to other health system in other, in other uh, region of Spain or in other countries even. Like how specific uh, of the local, uh, let's say, health system is uh, uh, what you are finding? Um, I mean, it, 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 the sound has cut a, a, little, a little bit in the middle of the question, but you you say that how is uh, translatable to other? If, if you, you can, I mean, if what we have uh, concluded can be extrapolated to other regions or to other exactly, exactly, like these uh, these studies that are based on data that comes from uh, local yeah. data. Like, how can they be? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the, the the short the short answer is I don't know, <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, the the more elaborated answer is uh, probably not quite. Well, translated, um, extrapolate, extrapolable. Um, probably there are. I mean, I was discussing with uh, Soren Brunak because they have similar uh, studies with the database in in, in Denmark. So probably uh, we are curious in comparing results, and probably we'll do at some point because probably I, I bet that probably there will be differences yeah. because of the. You know, because of the food, the weather, um, social habits, etc., etc. Probably across Spain will not be very different. Will not be very different. But in any case, it would be uh, almost equivalent to a, a randomized clinical trial. If you made a randomized clinical trial here in Spain with Spanish patient, probably you would ask the same question: What would happen with patient in other country with a different um, environment that you are not including in the in the uh, in the clinical trial. I mean, they are different. Yeah. the The, the second question is uh, is about the the mechanistic models, like, uh, and it's about the, the limitations of of the mechanistic models. So I, I was wondering, like, to what extent all those knowledge based mechanistic model can accommodate for the redundancy that is present in biological systems. 
just to give you an example, like for instance, activated cells produce a lot of interleukins to then induce the proliferation of these cells. Now, it's not like the specific interleukin, it's more like you know, the action of many interleukins that are produced. So like from, from those graphs, you are actually retrieving like pairwise associations, like very specific type of, uh, of information. But actually like the biological system are much more noisy and much more redundant. So like to what extent those mechanistic models so precise can accommodate, accommodate for what actually seems to, to, to happen in reality? Uh, well, again, the, the quick question is I don't know, <laughs> but, but I, I, I would, again, I would bet that probably, um, I mean, in our experience, it depends very much on, um, on the um, specific type of study. For example, um, if we, we deal with signaling and we are working with cancer, which is a disease mainly of signaling, the results that we have got are very, um, to me, I mean, the first time that we get the result, I was surprised because I, I didn't expect the model to work so well. Uh, as you go to other diseases in which the signaling is not the main component, you probably need to include other details in the, in the, in the models. And the redundancy is, is, I mean, is built in in the in the in the it should be built in in the model. But uh, uh, again, <laughs> I don't know. Probably because we go from the simplest uh, application to the to more complex application. Uh, in the case of cancer, they work very well from a practical point of view. <laughs> What okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, if there are no other... Yes, one, there, please. Well, Clean, this is Shmita. Uh, uh, I was wondering a philosophical question that what you were saying that uh, uh, you try to make sense of, let's say, at the gene level, then do the pathway and all that. But in the presence of multiomics data, suppose we just feed in gene data, protein data, metabolic, metabolomics data, of course, to run any model, you have to do the dimension reduction. But however, at the end of it, we will get some result. And then try to explain this in the context of system biology. Is that a better approach or just uh, dig as much as you can in one platform and try to translate that into another platform of molecular data. Um, uh, yes, it's philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, again, I'm very practical uh, in terms of the application that we developed. And we were very centered around gene expression. Why? Because gene expression is uh, quite, I mean, it's very cheap to obtain. There are a lot of gene expression, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, everybody's now talking about multi-omics. Um, actually, some, some omics are a bit redundant on them. Uh, but to... Um, Accommodate other omics like uh, I mean probably if we could measure proteins instead protein activity instead of, of gene expression I would go obviously for protein activity because we are using gene expression as proxies of protein expression as proxies of protein activity mm -hmm. so we are prox we are using proxies of proxies which but this. This is because this is the data that we have, and this is available and cheap, etc. Um, you can you can use also uh, meta metabolites, but we, we we don't have metabolites in the model. We are working on that, but you should use also metabolic pathways, and we should take into account that some of these metabolites are activating. Or the activating gene, so are at the, at the same time activators and the activators. And you have another problem for the model on top of that, because uh, we don't know. I mean, we can we know how measure genes 
Hogan's genes. You can say, okay, this gene is up, this gene is up, they are producing at the same rate. But I don't know if, if we normalize genes and we normalize metabolites, if 0,5 in genes is same as 0,5 in metabolites. I don't know how to align the scales. Okay. Um, so there are still a lot of problems for this, for this um, and you need to model that uh, more. And um, uh, I don't know if I have, I have answered your question. Right? <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, we thank again uh, Dr. Joaquin Dobazo and uh, thank you. Thank you.